Hello, everyone, and welcome back. I'm Joe Chappelle, and you're listening to the OBGYN Podcast. This is episode 21. This is our journal club for August 2017. And with me today to go through our paper are two very special guests. The first you know him is Dr. Jerry Ballas from Houston. Hello, Jerry. Good evening. Good to have you. Good to be back. And then our other guest you should also know well now, and that is Dr. Sarah Kim from Stony Brook. Welcome, Sarah. Hello. Good to be back. All right. So today we are going to be taking a paper from the Green Journal. This is from July 2017 and is entitled Patterns of Opioid Prescription and Use After Cesarean Delivery. Um, Brian Bateman is the lead author on this, and it comes from a, you know, a whole bunch of different uh, hospitals together. So before I get started with this, uh, going through this paper, do you guys have any uh, opening thoughts about this? Obviously, it's a very sensitive, uh, timely issue uh, that everyone's kind of talking about right now. Yeah, I totally agree. I think this is a very good paper for us to kind of start uh, to have a discussion about, um, just because the you know, as the paper kind of describes, we'll get to it as, as well as that. I think, you know, we're facing like an opiate epidemic where um, abuse is definitely on the rise. And I think it kind of starts the discussion of what is our responsibility as physicians in maybe potentially contributing to this possible epidemic. No, absolutely. And I also, you know, on three different levels, driving in the other day to work, of course, NPR has a, a story about the opioid crisis and the latest figure that came out that something upwards of 90 some odd million dollars were spent by the pharmaceutical industries that produce opioids to directly market to physicians and so forth, uh, which I thought was pretty telling. Um, And then, of course, at work, we're embroiled in kind of a patient care uh, conference in terms of pain management opioids. So it's definitely a hot topic um, and definitely something that, especially for practitioners in a surgical field, we need to be open and start discussing more about our prescribing habits. Yeah. Uh, you know, this is not in this paper, uh, but other ones have discussed this. You know, this is a very much a uh, problem of our own making. Uh, and I don't mean OBGYNs, I mean medicine in general. When we started talking about the, uh, you know, pain as being a vital sign and people, everyone had to have their pain well controlled, um, you go down that path, you know, a little too far and you end up exactly where we are. Um, so anyway, you know, we uh, in OBGYN prescribe probably, I, don't know, I shouldn't say that, we do a lot of C-sections, so therefore we prescribe a lot of narcotics. So I don't know if we're the highest um, number, you know, uh, prescribing physicians in the country, but we have to be pretty close as a, as a collective. So I think it's definitely a topic for us. Oh, absolutely. And by sheer numbers, the paper even mentions it's the most commonly performed surgical procedure in the United States on an annual basis. So even by just volume, we are definitely um, on the forefront of prescribing pain medication. Exactly. So let's get started with their paper. Um, I'll start with the introduction, as we usually do. Um, They started off basically saying, we just said that, you know, we have an epidemic. Uh, It's reaching crisis stage, if it isn't there already. um, And we do have a a place to play in it. Um, And, you know, a couple of things that some are in here and some aren't. But, you know, 75% of opioid abusers start um, by taking your friend's or relative's leftover medication. And they do stress something, but they don't have that exact number in there. Uh, but they do have some other numbers. Um, 66% do not dispose of their leftover narcotics appropriately. Um, 60, 20% report sharing with their friends of those who do have leftover. Um, so it's definitely, it, not only are we worried about the woman, we're also worried about the people around her. It's like a, it's like a negative halo effect um, from giving uh, you know a... A package of pills uh, to somebody. Yeah, and I wonder. Um, the paper does doesn't goes into a little bit later, but as physicians, do we have a responsibility to maybe kind of, I guess, counsel patients and on how to dispose of them? Because I is saying that a lot of pills are kind of left over, but I wonder how much of that is patients don't even think about that they need to actually dispose of this, and do they even even know how to correctly dispose of the medication that we are prescribing them? Go through your own medicine cabinet, I guarantee you, you you're going to find, you know, NyQuil from 1998. Mm -hmm. Nobody (laughs) throws anything out until they do one big spring cleaning. Um, So it's definitely uh, an interesting idea to bring to the mind is the proper removal of all expired medications, but let alone medications that you are not using, especially like an opioid. Right. Yeah, I mean, you can get into trouble with a lot of these things, even... 
you know, kids taking blood pressure medication or whatever is laying around, anything can be dangerous. Um, but unfortunately, opioids um, have such an addictive effect that that's, you know, really where we get in trouble. Right. So I think they, they do a pretty good job here of laying out why they wanted to look at this. Mm-hmm. Um, and then they talk about the their like second to last paragraph is really about this. We really don't have any data here. We have no information to even base a study on. Let's say we wanted to do an intervention where we were going to decrease the number of opioids that we were prescribing or women we were using. Well, we don't even have the baseline stat to even design that study. And, and that's where this really came in. That's what they were trying to do here. Yeah, and I think they clearly state the objective, which I thought was you know well stated you know, in the beginning. And I think they um, constantly try to come back to their objective when they're you know throughout the paper. Yeah, you know, I would I'm gonna disagree with you for a second because I'm not really sure they define their objective in the manuscript. Well, I think they define it in a way by stating that they that there is no there are, is no good research out there or good data on prescribing habits. And so I think by reiterating that, they're placing their paper kind of at the forefront of at least giving that descriptive nature of how we are prescribing. Um, So I think for me, that's where they kind of fill, they they keep mentioning how they're filling that void Mm -hmm. of no baseline data for how we prescribe. I I agree with you. You know, we talk about papers and and Jerry and I talked, talked about this in the past is that we look at two things. One is the study itself, and then how that study is portrayed on paper. And I'm a stickler in general for objective. It's one of the few things that I, I find very, very important, because I need mm-hmm. to know how to interpret your study. They do have a good objective in their abstract, which we'll get back to later, but their abstract says, to define the amount of opioid analgesics prescribed and consumed after discharge, after cesarean delivery. That's perfect, concise, wonderful. Mm-hmm. That I think that should have been included in their introduction. Because I don't really see that in the introduction, which doesn't really hurt their study. It's just, for me, it's just a you know matter of um, protocol. In any case, um, so move on to their methods. First of all, they did um, six different uh, university hospitals, um, which means they do it through six different IRBs. Mm-hmm. So God bless them. <laughs> um, and coordinating that is not easy. Um, and then you look at their numbers. This must have been done in a pretty short amount of time. Um, but in any case, so their inclusion criteria were all women who underwent cesarean delivery, um, which is nice. So they did not separate by planned or unplanned. Um, and you can talk, we could talk about later whether we think that bias is the results at all. Um, their exclusion criteria were pretty simple. Um, they took non-English speakers uh, out. Um, they Anyone with a lack of capacity who was younger than 18 also were, were not included. And then the last one was hospital stays greater than seven days. And they said because people who were there more than seven days may have had more complicated uh, courses and therefore, you know, different pain needs. Uh, They were also looking at, you know, women two weeks after they were discharged. But if you're in the hospital for a week after you deliver, you know, then now we're talking three weeks. So it does kind of muddy the waters. Uh, The seven days seems kind of random to me. They just chose a day, which is okay. Um, Any guys have any thoughts on the inclusion exclusion? No, I think they're pretty straightforward. Yeah, agreed. Mm -hmm. All right. So then the way they actually did the study, this is very simple. Um, they called the patients two weeks afterwards uh, by telephone. But sorry, before they left the hospital, they got verbal consent to call them. Right? And they called them two weeks later. Then if they weren't there, they tried them again every day over the course of five days. And if they didn't answer, they were lost to follow up. Then they asked them a uh, standardized uh, question set uh, and recorded their answers. Pretty straightforward. And speaking to your six different IRBs, it's amazing they dedicated an entire paragraph kind of going over the different ways they contacted women and where they were allowed to opt out and so forth. It was kind of a, I don't know whether it was necessary or not, but it was a little worried where they start with consent procedures, differed, et cetera. Uh, not sure you kind of needed that. Yeah. Maybe, maybe there was something there where the reviewer sent back saying uh, something to that effect. Yeah, um, you know, Dr. Kim and I are involved in, uh, I should actually state, Dr. Kim and I are involved in a very similar um, study at the moment, mm-hmm. which we started before this paper came out. Um, it's a little discouraging. But in any case, <laughs> um, <laughs> the way we solved this is we got telephone consent when we uh, when we called them and then recorded that, which, is, again, is still not ideal. And the IRB gives a, you know, a little bit of a hard time about that. Right. You know, they always prefer to have written consent. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so there aren't many good ways of doing this kind of study, but right. what they did seemed fine. Yeah. Um, one little note: they used a red cap 
mm-hmm. um, to do their data collection, which is um, just not new anymore, but it's a, a big rising trend in uh, data collection. It's a secure web-based application that's HIPAA compliant that you can put all your um, research in, um, as opposed to doing it in you know Excel and you know, locking the file and you know, wherever the other right. old ways are doing it. Um, so it's becoming very popular for people who don't know about it. Yeah, we're definitely using it for some of our research, uh, especially for international work, kind of broadening your your institution's uh, involvement. So yeah, red caps definitely become pretty commonplace. Yeah, Stony Brook I think brought it bought a uh, institutional license for it, so anyone at Stony Brook can use it, which is which is nice. All right, so moving on to the results, um, they took 1,065 women who underwent cesarean delivery and consider them for inclusion. Uh, 55 did not consent. 35 met the exclusion criteria. 252 were unable to be reached, which left them left them with a total of 720 women. The average age was 30.7. About 60% were white. 77% were privately insured, which is important, I think. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 45% labored before the cesarean delivery. 37.5% had a repeat cesarean delivery, and we can guess that the rest of those were primary cesarean deliveries for breach or, or mm-hmm. what have you. 14% were smokers, and less than 5% had a history of alcohol or other substance abuse issues, um, which, again, is probably important for this kind of study. Mm-hmm. Um, say 98 over, over 93% had uh, epidural or spinal, um, and then we get into the pain stuff. So the median median maximal pain score, which is not confusing at all, mm-hmm. um, <laughs> at hospital <laughs> discharge was five, uh, with an interquartile range of three to six. Now, the way that interquartile range works for people who don't know is they take the median, so that's five, that's the exact middle, of, it's like the 50 percentile right in the middle of the group, and then they divide the, on either side into 25% and 25%. So it's like a, a median of a median, if you will. What it tells you is that 75% of the women um, were between three and six, All right? So that's how that works. Uh, during the first week, the medium is now four with a two to five interquartile range. And then the week two, presumably where they were calling women, it was, uh, one to three, uh, or sorry, two with an interquartile range of one to three. So as expected, the pain goes down as you get distant from surgery. So that was nice. At least we know nothing funky is going on. Mm-hmm. Uh, of the 720 women, 85% reported filling their opioid prescription, so that's 15% that didn't, uh, which I thought was a pretty decent number for women who didn't even fill it. And for the most of them, they basically said they didn't need it or didn't want it or they didn't like the way it made them feel, which I think anyone who does obstetrics has heard a woman say exactly that. Right. Then we get into what that was actually prescribed, and this is interesting. So most of them used oxycodone, yeah, about 8% used uh, hydrocodone or uh, Vicodin. And then the number prescribed was interesting. So most of the women got 40, right? And mm-hmm. then some women got less than you know 30 or less. Mm-hmm. So in our hospital, and then Jerry, you can tell me what they do down in Houston, but we, we like routinely use 30 as mm-hmm. our number, which I even thought that was too high. Mm-hmm. And apparently we're not that bad. Yeah, 30 used to be kind of the default. And I can tell you we've, uh, we've switched over to NSAIDs and Tylenol number three for the most part for most of our C-section women. Wow, that's good. Yeah. Wow. yeah, it's good. Um, there's definitely, you could imagine a few that slip through that maximal median pain mm-hmm. um, that we have to convert to, but uh, we've kind of taken it upon ourselves to almost do an about face on opioids and cut down to T3s for the most part. Mm-hmm. And do that inpatient as well or yeah. just outpatient? Inpatient as well. Wow. wow. Mm-hmm. Good for you. All right, well, mm-hmm. we'll hold on to that till the end of the conversation here, right. and we can talk more about that. I want to hear more. So then getting into the rest of the results here. So they dispensed 40. That was uh, the median uh, interquartile range was 30 to 40. Um, most women, again, median was 20 of number of pills used with an interquartile range of 8 to 30. So the average leftover was 15 uh, with an interquartile of 3 to 26. So a little variation in the used and leftover, but uh, the median was still 20. Right, so mm-hmm. we know that 20 is probably okay. Um, let's see. There was They then broke it down into three uh, segments. Those who got 40, those who got between 30 and 40, and those who got less than 30. Mm-hmm. Right? And they looked at the some of the differences. There was no difference in pain satisfaction or satisfaction with pain control, despite mm-hmm. the number of Rx. 
which I think uh, Dr. Kim and I, not that we want to give away our secrets here, but we kind of have been seeing the same thing in our in our study. Mm. Um, 5% requested a refill, which is a pretty low number. Um, looking at who thought they had too little and who thought they had too much, 15% um, in the less than 30 thought they had too little versus basically the same in the, in the other two groups, which was 10 or 9, so about a 5% difference. And then too much, the um, less than 30 and the 30 to 40, both about 21% thought they had too many. And 36% in the 40, uh, dispense 40 group, thought they had too much, which again, Dr. Kim and I can, can kind of say is about what we're, we're seeing as well. Right. Um, then they did a, it's called a negative binomial model, which for all intents and purposes, we'll think of as a um, regression, okay. where they basically take all the um, confounders and they put it all together and they see what, what shakes out. Uh, and basically, um, nothing mattered. Um, pain at discharge. Maternal age, labor, before, before section, smoking, antidepressant use, benzodiazepine use, type of anesthesia, length of stay, opioid type, NSAID use, or hospital that they delivered at made no difference in whether they thought they had too much or too little. Mm-hmm. Uh, anything else in the results or anything you think I, I, I glossed over or missed that you guys want to bring up before we move on? Well, I think you kind of alluded to, I don't know if you were going to get to it later, but the... Um... The distribution of patients, at least, and again, this this I think will catch the eye of people that work in different academic centers or different patient populations. But the proportion of privately insured, um, the fact that they did not use any non English speakers, I can tell you right off the bat in my practice where I'm at, how applicable this information is. It's kind of difficult to um, to take for as a kind of one to one comparison. Now, whether those factors overall really, really make a difference, um, I'm not too sure. Um, but that is one thing that kind of popped out at me looking at the centers that were involved and the patients that were um, the, the patient makeup. The majority were white, um, privately insured, and English. And I can tell you that's pretty much the opposite of my patient population down here in Houston. I mean, absolutely. Whenever we look at a paper and uh, you have to say, is the study pop- population my population, mm-hmm. right? Uh, even if you believe exactly everything they said was right, they did the study well, and you got the results and you trust it, that still doesn't mean it's applicable to you and what you do on a daily basis because you have to look at the population. Um, I will tell you that one of our residents here, Stony Brook, last, uh, last year did a study looking at how safe women felt after uh, same-day discharge for hysterectomy, laparoscopic hysterectomy. And they found that the five um, people who identified themselves as primarily Spanish speaking were the basically the only five who felt that they didn't have enough support when they went home. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, There are cultural differences that need to be taken into uh, account. And again, not to say that that would make a difference in this, um, Mm -hmm. but it might. Cultural awareness of pain. Oh, I I think it can actually be a huge, um, huge part of this terms of whether women feel like their pain is being adequately um, addressed. Um, and, and on each end of the spectrum, those that never feel like their pain is being adequately addressed or those that will not complain of pain no matter what. Mm-hmm. Um, so there is definitely a cultural component that this paper may kind of miss. Yeah. Yeah. And then I, I don't know why it's bothering me. I mean, does the age seem to be a little older than you would expect, or, is, or am I just kind of? I mean, I'm I, I'm fine with that because, well, you know, I, I had kids at an older age, so this makes <laughs> me feel comfortable and and part of the norm. But um, it seemed like an older age, and I don't know if that matters or if anyone else feels. Well, I think it may be an effect of the both the um, racial breakdown mm-hmm. and also the privately insured. Right. You know, the whiter and more you know privately insured your population is on average, the older they're going to be when they are delivering. I think that's like the trend now where people are having children a little bit later. And I think I agree that's like a um, potentially a reflection of the demographics of, you know, the patient population involved in the study. Right. Exactly. I was going to say the the overall, we say the patients are getting older and so forth. Mm-hmm. But remember, I think, again, that's a cultural um, phenomenon because I, my patient population, again, there's older women having babies, but they've already started having babies from when they were young. So mm. it's an interesting just thing that popped out of my mind, too. 
I didn't catch that. That was good. Mm -hmm. All right. So moving on to the discussion, uh, and then I think the three of us are going to have our own little discussion, it feels like. But going on to their discussion, um, they say that first off, um, we don't know what normal usage is. This is why they wanted to do this. Uh, again, that cesarean delivery is most commonly performed surgery in the U.S. Um, and if each woman gets 16 extra pills than she needs, that's equal to 20 million extra pills of narcotics per year, which is a sobering thought. And then they also found that the more pills that were prescribed, the more were used, regardless of whether the patient felt that she had good pain control or not. So that's important. And then we start getting into the nebulous stuff. So that's all the stuff that they can say based on their you know, their data here. And then they start questioning, okay, well, what are the effect of um, the women taking extra pills if they start going to change how they feel about their pain? Um, and then, you know, so do they get more abuse? Do they end up, do we end up with more addicts that way? Um, and the second thing again is all these, you know, 20 million extra pills. And what is that doing? Uh, where are they going? Um, are they really just sitting in a medicine cabinet for five years and then being thrown out? Or are they being used? And of course, we don't know that. Then the last thing, uh, and then we'll get into our discussion here, is um, talking about limitations, right? So there's a couple limitations here. Uh, the first is recall bias. Um, they are calling people and asking them uh, about how their pain was a week before. Uh, they're asking them how many pills they have left. If they can't, if they don't have the bottle with them, they're asking them to estimate how many they have left. So there is some recall bias. I don't know if it's that important, but it's there. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's, this is what uh, Jerry was getting to. There's selection bias, right? They selected these women, first of all, based on the hospital they're in. So they can't do anything about that. But then also there's women who they couldn't follow up. You know, maybe those women couldn't follow up because they were in more pain and they couldn't get to the phone. I mean, that sounds kind of silly, but maybe. Right. Um, so there's definitely a little selection bias going on there as well. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. That's about 25% if you look at it, right? 20 to 25% of yeah. non-follow up. They weren't able to reach. Um, so, again, you can't interpret that in any specific way, but that is a, a huge amount of people that you got to wonder if you performed a cesarean delivery on somebody, how two weeks later you're unable to reach them. Um, right. that, that's, I don't know if that speaks towards just our fractured medical system or these patients in particular, this patient population. Um, it's hard. Yeah. So the issues I kind of want to talk to the, the two of you about, um, and I want to get into uh, Jerry's uh, Tylenol number three, um, uh, their experiment they're doing down there is what can we do? And can we, now we, we, first of all, we know there's an opioid issue, right? We know even just if there's 20 million extra pills a year, um, we know we're contributing to it in some way. Maybe it's not huge, probably is, but how do we, what can we do to stop this? You know, some of the issues are we want women to be satisfied with their pain control. We don't want that many women to feel like they have to call us for a refill because that puts barrier to that. Um, so we want to affect change in the number of pills we're prescribing while, while at the same time you know, making sure we're not decreasing our quality of our patient care. So how do we go about doing that? So I can tell you from our experience, what spurred it on actually was the state of Texas changed the scheduling for narcotic prescribing. And so it actually became almost um, a protocol-driven change in paradigm because we didn't have enough providers with triplicates that could truly keep up with the amount of residents patients we were discharged if that makes any sense and so they changed the scheduling on our norcos and vicodin to make them much more stringent where every single one of them needed to have a triplicate couldn't be ordered any other way and so it actually was somewhat burdensome but it actually spurred on a discussion amongst attendings as to do we need to be prescribing all of this across the board, like we used to in residency, pretty much stamp prescriptions, three, you know, 30 days supply, here's your Vicodin, head out at the door. So we actually started really talking about how do we prescribe our pain medication. And so beyond pain scores, we actually started actively managing expectations. And so that's actually the big buzzword in a lot of pain control circles is managing patient expectations. And this starts during the prenatal course. When you start talking to patients about pain management during labor, pain management if you need a C-section, you talk about pain management immediately after, you get them ambulating early, you get them eating early, you get them kind of moving to their regular routine earlier, and that's part of the expectation. 
And this study actually speaks to that. By virtue of giving more pills, in some way you are telling women, expect to have more pain. And so you should probably take more medication. That's how I read that one graph, figure number three. You give more, people are going to take more because you're the doctor. You're prescribing this for a reason, right? So if you're going to give me 40 pills, well, you must know what's going on. I may need 40. So I think a lot of pain uh, management comes to managing ex. After the change um, with, the t- with, I guess, not prescribing narcotics, um, how has the pain satisfaction been for the patients? Has it we stayed have, the same? We have not noticed any big differences. There haven't been um, any, um, nothing from the nurses. So usually the first line is going to be nursing, right? right. Nursing is going to let you know that their patients are calling them more often. Their patients are suffering. They're going to advocate for their patients. Mm-hmm. And we really have not seen um, We haven't been, I haven't looked at data in terms of um, from the nursing side, whether they've um, objectively been recording more instances of inadequately controlled pain. But I can tell you at least um, some subjectively or anecdotally from resident interactions, and I do a lot of postpartum rounds, that We've barely skipped a beat in terms of discharging patients timely or having any big events postpartum. And it's interesting where a lot of the discussion actually comes from is managing our patients who come in with a history of chronic pain or women who are on, say, methadone for addiction or they're in some sort of recovery program. We actually learned a lot of that from them in terms of managing expectations and preparing them and thinking of alternative medication um, in order to um, help them along. Something like anesthesia, you know, using Toradol more liberally at the end of procedures in order to give that extended non-steroidal effect. Um, you know, also using Duramorph to kind of give more of a prolonged, at least immediate post-operative effect to allow us early ambulation um, afterwards and get them moving around and limiting that expectation of sitting in bed still, not moving in order to save themselves. And what do you do with your uh, NSAIDs? Do you do around-the-clock um, scheduled, or do you do PRN? We'll do sch- I personally, um, I will do scheduled. I will tell the residents, just keep it scheduled, especially NSAIDs, those are anti-inflammatories. Mm. That is the majority of mm. where their pain is going to be coming from. Um, and so I will schedule, obviously individualize it to patients with, say, you know, preeclampsia with renal right. involvement, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Um, if we need to pull out kind of, you know, experimenting with new things like tramadol, you know, different types of medications, that can also help. All right. And then the Tylenol number three, you do a PRN? PRN. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, interesting. I mean, we are, again, I don't want to give away my secrets, but <laughs> um, we're doing another study here where we are um, doing exactly, well, not exactly that. We are uh, changing from, um, PRN to scheduled uh, Tylenol mm-hmm. and ibuprofen to see what effect that has a d- d- effect that has on inpatient opioid use, and the opioids being PRN. Um, now, are the opioids being basically given by the nurses? Say, oh, you should take these. Well, then if it is, then it won't be affected at all. Um, but if it's really patient driven, you would expect to have some difference if the the uh, ibuprofen, especially, is around the clock. Yeah. One of the interesting things that um, Dr. Kim, uh, who's doing a lot of this, uh, the phone calls for our study here, uh, found that no matter how many pills the women used, the women used, mm-hmm. um, how many pills they had left, how many pills they were prescribed, almost every single woman said something along the lines of, yeah, but I have really good pain tolerance. Right. Right. Yeah, Is- that's, that's, that's kind of been the, the theme of what, every time I call. It's like, oh, well, even if they used everything or even if patients who've asked for refill... They say, well, I have really high pain tolerance, but I needed this. Um, so I kind of, I think I agree with um, you, Jerry, in the sense of, of, I guess, expectations and patient's perspective of pain. Um, I think patient's perspective of pain maybe is obviously different from how we view their pain. And also that may be what sets them up in terms of what their expectations are. If they expect to have a lot of pain, then they're going to say, well, I tolerated that, so I have actually high pain tolerance, when in reality, that's probably the same amount of pain that most other people may still be you know, experiencing. I think that's the way they view their pain is kind of, col- it's kind of interesting how um, that also kind of colors their um, possible um, opiate use. 
And I think that also, I think what also bothered me about the, not bothered, but um, caught my eye about the older population in this study was how do you manage the younger patient who has no expectation of this kind of pain, has no um, real basis for this. Um, And those seem to be the tougher ones to really convince that they're okay. You're going to be okay. You're, you need this medication when you need it, but you don't need it around the clock. Um, those are the patients I tend to have kind of the more difficult interaction. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I think the next step, uh, and again, this is something that uh, Sarah and I are working on, is we like to be able to give overall less narcotics or maybe even switch to Tylenol 3. Mm-hmm. We'll have to think about that. Um, of course, we don't do that right now. It's going to mess with our study. Mm-hmm. Well, let's not do that. But in any case, right. <laughs> it's a little bit of a joke. A um, little bit. So can we you know, reduce the number for most people, but then have some way of predicting who's going to need more based on whatever factors that we can come up with, whether it be uh, inpatient, uh, opioid use, um, or other things to say, okay, uh, 95% of you get 20 or 15 maybe even. Um, but you know, these women who hit this threshold, we know you're going to need more. So let's give you more. Um, so that we, you know, don't get those refill requests or maybe we should say the refill requests aren't bad. And as long as we make a easy way for a woman to get that refill, that's not like a barrier. They don't call at 10 o'clock at night and no one can do it for them. Then maybe we give everyone 15 or 20 and say, Hey, if they need refills, well, then we'll sort that out and just make the system better. Um, but I think there is some, I think what you talked about there, Jerry, is perfect. You know, you got uh, a stimulus to say, let's rethink how we do this. Let's mm-hmm. rethink our assumptions around pain control and see if we can do it differently. Um, and I think what the paper says to me is, okay, great, we're thinking about it. Mm-hmm. And how many are we actually using? There were women in here who got 80, 80 pills. Oh, yeah. Right. That's a lot. Mm-hmm. We had lot. One, we had one woman in our study um, <laughs> that had 180 pills yeah. <laughs> prescribed. 180. Yeah. And she was not a she was not like a chronic pain patient. That was mm-hmm. she was just a standard patient. Right. So we got to think about what we are doing as a as a whole, and mm-hmm. think of ways of reevaluating the system that we have created around pain control, and how can we alter that? Yeah. All right. Another thing I thought about too is you know something non pharmacologic that you can see from other other literature and other aspects of our specialty even is something as simple as a callback. You know, I remember distinctly in Stony Brook as a resident, Mm -hmm. the callback list for on. Oh, my God. (laughs) I remember managing the callbacks and thinking this is just the the biggest torture for us. Um, But it did reduce the amount of people that I believe came back to our ER or got readmitted. And I think it actually could play well into managing expectations having phone calls to your post-op patient and listening to them and explaining to them and validating their concerns, but at the same time reinforcing that they are getting better. And to hear that from a physician or even a nurse practitioner or somebody from practice could actually help to, I think, reduce how much pain medication women feel they need. I um I definitely agree on that aspect. I mean, it, it's definitely something to think about. Um, just because when I did call the you know these patients back and they were like, oh, like you're a doctor from Stony Brook, you know, they were a willing to answer my questions on the survey, but also willing to just to talk about what they've been feeling, how the postpartum course has been. They had a lot of questions, and overall, they all were very appreciative of the fact that I called them. Although, like for me, I was appreciative they were answering my questions on the survey. Um, so it made me realize that you know these patients, especially probably like for like the primary section, it's like their first baby. They have a lot of questions about, you know, am I allowed to take this like medication like how much pain am I supposed to feel post-op day like six or seven so I agree it's just a matter of a lot of it is time issues a little bit too you know as residents it's difficult to call every single postpartum patient um, I try to do it for my study but it's something you know definitely a good point but something for I guess like logistical purposes we have to think about how we can actually you know make that come to fruition Oh, right. Absolutely. I mean, these are outside the box kind of thoughts Mm -hmm. um, that, you know, it's good. It's a hard sell, even for private practice, get residency, but a Mm -hmm. a private practice having that kind of um, ability as well. So um, just 
you know, you have to span everything pharmacologic, non-pharmacologic um, to try to bridge this gap. You know, women become an island after delivery. We all know that, both socially, uh, medically. You know, they're kind of stuck with a lot of bad advice mm -hmm. after they deliver and bad resources. Um, we all know this. I mean, if you go to the mommy blog universe, I mean, there is some crazy stuff out there. And let alone listening to your friend, your mom, your sister, all who went through pregnancy, all who honestly, you know, probably either forgot or they've created some sort of illusion around their pain experience mm -hmm. and probably aren't all that helpful. And so have somebody objective that was involved in care or um, somewhat close to what they went through, be able to touch base with them. I think could go a long way. Yeah, but there are there's a there's plenty of models for this, and there are actually places that do this already for uh, postpartum, whether it's section or or vaginal. Well, they they have they get assigned up basically a home health nurse mm -hmm. who will call them, and Absolutely. if they feel like they need to actually go there, they'll go and see them. Mm -hmm. Right, and that cuts down on ER visits. It cuts down on uh, even you know stopping breastfeeding. Like all these things uh, get improved just by simple someone checking and calling and saying are you all right um but that goes against uh this unfortunately in, in the united states where we don't want to pay for prevent preventative health care <laughs> right you only want to pay for you know emergencies um because there's more money in it right mm -hmm. so um this is where i think a, a dollar spent on the front end saves you oh, ten dollars yeah. on the back end Agreed. so the fact that you did something like that down in Houston, Jerry, gives me hope that other places are are trying out different things as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I hope it's okay, Jerry. Maybe at the at the end or at the show notes, um, if you want to put some contact information information for you. So if any sure. of our listeners want to contact you about the what your program you did there and how it worked, and maybe they want to do something similar in their own place. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. And we're actually having um, I, not to plug this. We're having a conference down here in Houston, and. Um, I may be speaking at a session about our kind of multi-pronged approach at pain control. And then the National Perinatal Association that I'm president-elect of now in 2018 in March, we're having a, our annual conference in Loma Linda about substance use in pregnancy. But part of it is going to be about legal substance use and how do we manage um, that kind of you know changing paradigm in treating women's pain both during and after the uh, delivery. So. Uh, it is a it, it's an interesting topic to me. Good, uh, so we'll definitely get that for anyone who wants to contact Dr. Ballas on that. Uh, to finish up on our paper here, uh, I just want to read their last line because I really think it's a it's a great little call to arms here. It says, "Quote: uh, Given the frequency of cesarean deliveries in the United States, obstetricians can play an important role in decreasing the supply of opioid medication introduced into communities, and should adopt more judicious prescribing patterns." and counsel women about the importance of safe leftover medication disposal. So I think it's exactly what we've been saying the, the whole time. And right. to be clear, I think this is a very well-written paper. Uh, again, mm -hmm. it's, it's, not, it's nothing complex. It's um, not going to change the world. But mm -hmm. it's saying we have a problem. What are we, what are, what's our current state? And at the end, saying we, we are in a position to really help here. We may not feel like we are because we're mm -hmm. not in the first line of the opioid crisis eh, in general, except perhaps in you know um, pregnant women who have opioid uh, issues. Mm -hmm. But we actually can prevent that ourselves just by doing some simple things. And so I thought that was a very nice way of ending their uh, manuscript. Absolutely, and I could actually see you know it may not be a complex paper, it may not be you know world altering, but I can see this paper being brought up as a reason to, at minimum change some postpartum prescribing practice and say, hey, look mm -hmm. at this paper. Maybe the person doesn't need more than 20. Let's institute kind of a 20 pill, 15 to 20 pill max, and then have some sort of follow-up that'll see if these women are doing okay with just that amount. Um, I think that paper kind of really, that number jumps out to me is this, don't go any more than 20. because There's absolutely no benefit to it. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't offer like specific guidelines per se, but mm -hmm. I do think the paper definitely um, kind of is a way to start a discussion in different places as to, you know, what are we doing right right now and what can we do differently to kind of not contribute to this opioid epidemic? And, you know, how do we go about, I guess, having the discussion with maybe patients, you know, like you guys are doing, you know, down there where 
even during the、um, prenatal visits, kind of to start a discussion about how do we counsel people about pain expectations and what to do afterwards with the medication as well. So I do think that、um, this paper is a good way to kind of start discussions in different places. All right. So I think that we all very much like this paper, which is、mm -hmm. uh, unusual so far in our three <laughs> journal clubs.、Uh, Six thumbs up. <laughs> Um, so, I, unless anyone has any other thoughts about this particular paper, I think I'm going to call this、uh, journal club to a close. Here, here. Great.、Okay. Right. So, hopefully, we'll have uh, these uh, these two、uh, these two people back for our for further journal clubs. This was kind of fun.、Um, look for next week. I hope to have the first episode of polycystic ovarian syndrome out,、um, which I'm having a lot of fun、uh, putting together. So, I hope you enjoy it as well. Polycystic ovarian? What? Hold on.、Uh, well, I know you. Maternal <laughs> fetal medicine doctor is going to back away from the microphone. You're really, you're really gonna like that that、uh, that、uh, episode, Jerry. I promise. Uh, and then、um, I believe we're gonna have even we're gonna have a new voice come in、um, probably the, later this month or next month,、uh, talking about antenatal steroid use、uh, during pregnancy,、um, which I know Jerry will like to listen to. So that that'll be exciting. In any case, well, thank you everyone for listening.、Um, we'll see you back soon.、Uh, so until then,、uh, thank you very much. Good night, guys. Good night. <laughs>